On this week's show, France are back. Are they though? Or are Scotland just shit? Or are they not? Also, explosive curry chip baby shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hot takes on New Zealand's antics. Yeah, and how babies are only fun whenever they're old enough to wrestle. <laughs> wrestle. Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe, together with Guinness. After an unexpected hiatus, I am delighted to be back. A hiatus? Oh, yeah. You double baby making yeah. son of a gun. Yeah, I did, Aren't you? I did it. I did it all. Yeah? Yeah. Was it easy, was I it? I brought two <laughs> babies into the world. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was pretty simple, man. Yeah? Yeah, I was like, even it had took the time to write a poem. Uh -huh. I was just kind of sitting there chilling and then next thing they were in my hands. Yeah. It was class. It's that easy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I must say I'm, I'm pretty happy with myself. Really? Lol. 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 Major uh, thanks to my wife and <laughs> the 15 other people. Took who, and mentioned to my wife. <laughs> 15 other people who got out of bed at three o'clock in the morning to deliver my two children. But yeah. Selfish time to have a baby, I think, isn't it? It was, but I, I, I think that was the magic of it. Uh -huh. It was, there was no one else in the hospital. Yeah. It was just quiet and weirdly kind of eerie. Uh -huh. And then it was like, we're Getting these babies Weird, out. Weirdly eerie, that's the setting for baby Annabelle. Yes. <laughs> the murderous doll oh, yeah. <laughs> to come tearing down the hall. Yeah, so I, 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 uh, I appreciate you saying what, what, why I named my children Michael and Annabelle. Uh -huh. You were a little bit off. Oh. Michael was correct after Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan. Uh -huh. Although, kind of wasn't as big a fan when you know he released like heal the world <laughs> <laughs> heal the world yeah make that it was a low point play. it wasn't cool enough and then it do not matter if you're black or white which i think we should use towards the end of the show for yeah our, very good for our feature though, yeah i'm not a fan of the song but it's yeah. a good way to to tee that up so that's your biggest issue with michael jackson yeah you know there was a few other things but we'll, we won't get into that yeah uh annabelle wasn't actually named after the serial killer Oh. Thingy, or the, what was it? The the doll. I never caught that movie. She was named after a serial killer, uh, Han Han Annabelle Lecter. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I wanted her to be tough, so I named her after. Yeah. You know, I don't want her to be treated like a girly girl, so I was like, yeah, no. call her after a, a cannibal from Silence of the Lambs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the perfect yeah. remedy Just to give that. Her, give her a chance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you've touched a lot on the fact that we had children, but you also. I too <laughs> <laughs> had a child. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah. Okay, earlier in the summer. You haven't it, mentioned that at all. Uh, no, because it wasn't current really. We came back and uh, baby Katie yeah. was um, six weeks old by the time we started first episode. So yeah, it wasn't really, it wasn't news, but obviously in my life it obviously has yeah. been a, a hashtag blessing. Absolutely. But hashtag disruptive. Is she? <laughs> No, no, she's Is been great. She? She's been Is great. She really? She's been great. You know, the beauty, obviously, having twins is mayhem, I would imagine. Yeah. But the beauty of having twins is that you don't have any older, dangerous uh, siblings, mm. overbearing siblings. Um, so Katie's six weeks old. Molly is just like two and a bit, two and a half or something. Molly's got... Molly's quite physical, mm -hmm. <laughs> a large, a large lady. <laughs> <laughs> Sound dead. Yeah, yeah, decent leg drive. Yeah. Um, and quite a, a thick, um, loud uh, North Belfast accent. Oh, yeah. So she's very enthusiastic about um, catering to all of Katie's needs. Um, aggressively. Yeah, aggressively, oh, yeah. yeah. Katie! <laughs> <laughs> so Anna, Anna uh, was downstairs with Molly and we heard um, Katie <laughs> crying upstairs and Molly goes and Molly took off and she goes I'm coming Katie <laughs> <laughs> just imagine Katie like just curling up in a ball going mommy please please keep Molly away from me <laughs> she means very well but she's the middle child now so yeah. she's gonna yeah, she's gonna be hard on her. Yeah, no, she is. Yeah, that's good though. <laughs> yeah, and how's Jack? He's just like, yeah, whatever. No, Jack's like pretty, um, pretty indicated, but he's he's been great. He's been uh, just a bit older and a bit more gentle and yeah. kind. He's putting her dummy in and helping okay. out and stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's great. That's mad. See, we Annabelle is still in hospital, so we haven't had her home yet. Michael uh -huh. is at home, so we kind of get a toe in the water 
with having him home and he's just shitting, crying, yeah. sleeping. That's it. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. She'll hopefully be home at the end of the week. Uh -huh. She's in ICU. Uh, thank you for also having a go off the fact that she was in ICU. Yeah, that was, was, that was flat. That was um, no one's there's no sacred place is there really when, you, when you're going after children in, in the ICU sick kids. department sick kids <laughs> it's pretty brutal and on that I want to give a massive shout out actually to the ICU department of the maternity hospital in Limerick and the whole maternity hospital in Limerick they're unbelievable just to get a little bit emotional for a second like uh, the way they've looked after her and the way they looked after Orla and, and Michael and now even me when I go in there every day they're like teaching me like little tricks to keep her happy or to, uh -huh. so I'm just in there soaking this stuff, all this stuff up. Really? So yeah, Nanette, uh, Gemma, Al uh, uh, Aoife, um, who else? Mary, Betty, just lads. <laughs> it's the greatest, what I think. What tricks have they taught you? Uh, they've got this one now where you kind of dance them with their ass to make them burp. Oh yeah, nice. That yeah. one's class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the old ass dance. Feeding them this way, feeding them like as if they'd be on the breast. Feeding them like oh, that. Okay. Good feeder. Them. Yeah. yeah. And just how to wash them and like wash down the way when, yeah. it's, when it's a girl, especially. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, which uh, I'm learning. Yeah. So, yeah, it's great. So, yeah. big, big thank you to all of them. I remember um, when, when Jack was born, maybe, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks or something, I was still very new to the nappy changing and all that. The technique that comes with it. Hmm. Um, so um, <laughs> Robbie Diak had uh, we fell at the same time. Fletcher, Jack's forgotten Fletcher, and Fletcher's forgotten Jack because he's moved back. Haven't okay. seen each other in a year. Oh. That's that relationship dead, yeah. <laughs> which is a shame. Can reunite them in years. Yeah, so. maybe. But I said to him recently there because I saw a picture of Fletcher on um, Insta Instagram. I was like, oh, Jack, do you remember him? <laughs> Blank face, not a clue. <laughs> Which is a shame because they were good mates. But yeah. anyway, so um, I went up, I, we were at um, Robbie and Kirsty's and uh, just catching up, whatever. Both newborns, both like wet behind the ears. And I went upstairs to change Jack. And then um, Robbie came up five minutes later and I had Jack in the air, naked, like poo all over his legs. And um, the, new, the, the new nappy I was putting on was like Velcroed to the old nappy. Oh, yeah. As there, Robbie, go get Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he, the, sorry, go on. I could have done with a few tips. Yeah, he had his first explosive shit the other night. Uh -huh. It was like one o'clock in the morning, Orla was in bed and I was like, every poo that he's had has been just a little pebble. Uh -huh. And like she's giving- Beautiful, me, cute little yeah. pebble. Yeah, and she gives me like four <laughs> little rolled up cotton buds that I just gently wipe him with, and then it's done. And then, so she went to bed, she's like, you'll be grand. I was like, yeah, yeah. And then he opened his baby grow at about one o'clock in the morning. It was like, I had a curry chip inside in the bag, and I just shook the curry chip all over the place. There was shit everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Like, all up his stomach, I'm like, oh, and I just started screaming. I was like, what do I do? And then I was trying to take those little cotton pads, just yeah. trying to dab them. But it's not a job for a cotton pad. <laughs> no. So I had to ring my sister-in-law. I was like, yeah. what do I do? She was like, do you want me to come down? Call 999. Like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, she was like, just wash him in the sink or hose him down a little bit. So yeah. Uh, so that was a bit of a When he was doing his little, his little pebbles, had yeah. Orla, had she seen like a full back explosion? No. Because I was, I was imagining that like she was in on it, no, and no. then uh, Michael was like, "Here's a couple of pebbles here, Orla." Like, <laughs> <laughs> when you see what I got for Daddy. <laughs> no, no, that was his first, and then he yeah. did a lot of ones. So anyway, that's. There's not. Do you find yourself again myself with Jack at the start? Do you find yourself just staring, especially because your two were even smaller again? Mm. And Jack was quite small. He was like six and a half or something. Mm. Yours were in round four. Four eleven and five. Four eleven. Okay, yeah. Tiny. Yeah, but like not. Bad no, for like sharing a womb. Yeah. Like, yeah, twins. They were pretty big. Yeah, yeah. But um, I just remember looking at like knees and like fingernails and yeah. just going, that is the nails and the mad, isn't it? Yeah. Have you have you have you clipped his nails yet? <laughs> no. Early? Is that terrifying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. I think Orla was on about biting his nails. Maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just bad kinda... habit to get into. <laughs> 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 Shoot his toenails. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> no, I think it's just we're just yeah easing into it now. I yeah. drove up with Flat this morning, and Flat was just kind of giving me the load on and how I was like, man, they're they're sleeping. He sleeps all the time, isn't it? And Flat was like, yeah, in about two weeks they'll start start screaming Not and stuff. Sleeping. And yeah. yeah, so uh, I think you know it's it's all ahead of us. But yeah, yeah. So yeah. the again in my experience that first restage, 
you're obviously more useful than me. I was a little bit useless at the start. Um, so then it, I just, I was going, right, I'm just going to have to wait until they're a bit older, until I get a bit. I always think men get broody whenever they see like an older, like a two year old, you know, and they get to play with them and interact and have the crack. Yeah. Whereas a newborn, you're kind of like, I can't really do much here. Yeah. I need to wrestle. If, unless I can, re I think that's the stage. Wrestle the kids. Wrestle the kids, because it's okay. obviously pretty inappropriate to be wrestling with them. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks. <laughs> Three weeks old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe Tough both enough. together, though. Tough Maybe enough. both together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd have a chance. Give them a chance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, well, look, that's enough of us talking about our children, I think. Yeah. Uh, I just want to. We didn't mention our children in the whole of last season. Before, <laughs> <laughs> before we get fly on to talk about rugby, uh, I want to offer a present. Uh, I think we both have, our wives have gotten us the same Oh yeah, I've gift. also got you a present. I think this is, yeah. I'm just give that to Orla, yeah. to see what it is. You didn't buy me a card, or you did buy me a I card. did get so a card, and you just wrote made. to be a bikini welcome. Yeah, <laughs> on a piece of paper. <laughs> Love, Baz, Orla, and Jacko and Cannibal. Yeah. Oh, two buddies. Uh, and two baby grows. A cat, a large cat. Yes, with a, no, just a cat. Good. has a nose ring. <laughs> <laughs> you might Perfect. want to take the nose ring out before you give it to the baby. Yeah, no, that's great. That's lovely. Choking. Thank you very much. Ryan. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Orla. Um, <clears throat> all right, we're going to talk about rugby. You've got a lot of a lot of rugby to talk about. I think we should give you like a, a a a safe word that you can say like from let's say Fifty Shades of Grey. Have you seen Fifty Shades of Grey? No. When they're Shoving things up each other's arses and all that kind of crack. <laughs> yeah. They give each other a safe word. That's going to be you and Fly, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Shoving the rugby up each other's arses. <laughs> and they've got a safe word to, to, that kind of allows them to stop. Uh -huh. So, I don't know, they say fucking Mary Poppins or something like okay, that. Okay, Mary so Poppins. Mary Poppins? Yeah. When we're talking too much rugby? Yeah, Mary okay. Poppins. Well, we've got loads of rugby coming up on the show today. <coughs> uh, we will get Fly on a few minutes to, to talk about everything that happened in uh, the championship in the warm-ups uh, between Wales and England and France and Italy. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, the game at the weekend that's coming up, uh, Ireland versus England. Um, before we get Jerry on, we wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you who've joined us on House of Rugby Ireland group on Facebook. Uh, I added my first photo last Love night. That. I want to get involved. Um, one of my favourite posts today was someone spotted Ross Byrne at Donnybrook <coughs> the other day, uh, which would suggest that he's not in Portugal, mm -hmm. which would suggest that he's not going to the World Cup. So someone posted that in our Facebook and there's a nice thread underneath it, um, which is like we have little scouts or birds um, that are out there, yeah, Game of Thrones style, yeah, just doing a bit of scouting for us. Like Aries, us these. Aries little birds. Yeah, it's a bit weird like. Whispering. It's a bit weird. Whispering on the, on, the, on the Facebook group. Like little penguins. So Ross Byrne. Little penguins. Uh, penguins are too um, conspicuous. I just don't want to <laughs> a be, big old penguin. I don't want to be too flattering towards our birds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like a mangy kind of. It needs to be like a like an old signal or a seagull or something. Seagull. Yeah. Great. Sea crow. Well, yeah. they're pretty. They're pretty conspicuous as well. <laughs> yeah. Drawing attention to themselves. I remember there was a a, a monster rugby fans website a forum uh -huh. and uh, it was good and all but some of it was a bit crazy like yeah and they would go off on uh on tangents about like their their hot takes and what the story was the players and stuff and my mates used to go on there and log in with face or fake accounts and start making stuff up and like yeah. one of them was like uh, i was looking in barry murphy's window last night and uh, he was having a fight with his girlfriend uh and uh, he doesn't look too happy. I, I think they might be breaking up, and uh, I think that's why he's playing bad at the, mo at the moment. <laughs> and there's this big, massive thread underneath it. Some people going, ah, I think that's kind of inappropriate, man. And then other people going, yeah, I think that makes sense, you know. Like, it's some people are going, that's what the forum's for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we encourage this as well, right, on the Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. Rumors. Rumors. They don't have to be true. <laughs> okay, we'll be back in two minutes with Fla. Hello and welcome back to part two and we're joined on the bed, the couch by Jerry Flannery. How are you Fla? Good lads. Good. Uh, good week? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, pretty productive. What were you up to? I watched, a very productive week. I watched a lot of rugby. You were over in, in the UK? Yeah, I went yeah. over to England last week. Uh, I was there on the Tuesday and the Wednesday and it was good, it was enjoyable, something different. I yeah. missed you then. You missed us. I yeah. listened to it, I thought you were on fire. Yeah. It was good. It. Yeah, it was... Um, 
I felt like I, I was waffling on quite a lot and Rob Vickerman had written, had oh, such yeah. a box, uh, such a, a, a big stack of notes on the game and I could see him getting ready and then we just kind of went off and, but he was, he was pretty cool with it. Like he allowed me to waffle on it. Well, it was good. I think if anyone hasn't listened to Ireland Unfiltered, thought that was brilliant, the one with Dion Fanning you did. This one uh, over our House of Rugby UK, brilliant again. The two shows you've had over the last couple of weeks, brilliant, but like, you're still getting fresh content out of all those three shows. Like there's still loads more to talk about. So like, Basically, this, you think I'm going to slag you here? I can see. My yeah, face. <laughs> where's, this, where's <laughs> it going? Where's it going? No, no, it's good. Really enjoyable. I think I'd like to get into stuff more, stuff like that. I love the stuff about Arsenal. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, Razzie and Jack when they when they were at Monster. And now seeing them in, in South Africa, it's one of the things I don't think you've touched on much. So we get into that. Greg O'Shea. Greg O'Shea. Yeah. Sexy. So I was in Drumolan Castle at the weekend. Mm. Um, wasn't a day or manner, which I thought it was a little bit of a slap in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And lucky you're not coming in here. Try to go to to Drumoland. How about you? Did you a good week? Yes. You're yeah. in Boston. So, yeah, it's across the pond. Um, uh, Fly and I last week met up with uh, a guy called James Kennedy, who owns uh, Rugby United in New York, um, and who actually he wants to do uh, a New York podcast. He wants to do a show from brilliant from the states. So. Sounds like it would be good. Yeah, sign us yeah. up. After you know where we we went we went to a barbecue place. We went to go to that seven 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 Mexican place, but it was like two hour wait for a table. So we went to Pit Brothers Barbecue, uh, which was pretty good. I thought, did you not? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, but when I went, to, so he, he he we were asking him all about how because I went to school with him in Munchens, and now he's setting up Rugby United New York, and they're signing Matthew Bastro, and they already have signed him, signed Ben really? Foden. Yeah. What? I know, it sounds insane. So we were trying to tease it out of him because he was a boarder in Munchens. You know? Teasing it out of him was, is, um, yeah, te- is polite. Yeah, 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 he yeah, was yeah. hammering him. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I've, I've met James a couple of times. So just in the last six months or something. Yeah. So I kinda, I've got come to terms with who he is because that's all I've ever known. He obviously went to school with him. Uh, and he said he was totally different in school. He bullied him in school. I didn't bully him. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, uh, he was, you know all the boarders in Munchens, man, are kind of like, they're, they're hard to understand because they're from the countryside and stuff like that. They're all kind of generic, like, and no, I met him, man. He was like, he was like this unbelievably articulate guy who was like saying, yeah, you know, I moved over to New York and we, we, we did his whole life. We covered his whole life. It was, it was pretty mental. Oh. And now he's out there and they've set up this team. And so that's his main job is, is running the club or does he do something else? Outside he's, that? No, his main thing is I think he's a contractor. He's a building company out there, the Murphy Kennedy Group. Okay. And that seems to be bankrolling <clears> the... Like so the, the team. How old is he? Fla wouldn't let him off the hook. So there's a 20, 20 year gap, or no longer, 25 year mm. gap from when Fla. Did, have you not seen him since school? Uh, I saw him once at a, at a reunion. Yeah, so he wanted to account for every moment in that 25 years. Okay. And then he would tell us stories about how when he arrived in New York. And he, he's, he's quite American now, or he's kind of embraced the American culture, mm. where he's kind of happy to talk about the opportunity and almost. Talk him, not not talk himself up, but talk about what he's capable of doing and mm. what he accomplished, which is not what we do <laughs> yeah. very well. But then he he told like a story about when he arrived and he did a couple of odd jobs and got opportunities. And then Flag goes right, so that's the first six months. Then what happened after that? <laughs> <laughs> I was going, he's just telling a story. Yeah. But, uh, where uh, where this guy is, where we perceive him to be now versus where he was when I met him in school is. It's light years apart. So yeah. I was trying to track what what was this journey that he went on where he got to there. Because like the shit he's talking about, man, he's like, I want to make Rugby United the best team in the world. And like that sounds insane. But it sounds insane that he that a guy that was in school with me in Munchens mm. would set up a team in New York and sign Matthew Bastro. Mm. So I was like, how the fuck did this happen, man? Yeah, it's great this is those opportunities. Like, would you ever consider like I mean, I suppose you everyone would consider working in the States in rugby with players that like, I mean, when you think about going to work in the States and rugby, it's always been to go over and work with players that don't have never played the game properly or mm, maybe yeah. play a little bit in college or something like that. But go and work with some of the best players in the world who are ending up there for one reason or another. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, at the moment, I think it's in just... In New be- York it City. Just, it, it's, I think he's, he's got more... I think that when they get marquee names like that, and I was asking him, I said, how, how do you... Why does Matthew Bastro come over? And he said, yeah, how old oh, is he? 
Bastro. Oh, yeah. Bastro. Did, he, he, he told us about how that negotiation took place or how Bastro got in touch with him. Yeah. He sent, a, he got, he DM'd him on Instagram and it was emoji of the um, Statue of Liberty, <laughs> question mark, emoji heart. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that it? Yeah, yeah. And he said, what did he say? He sent back, he sent back something like, <laughs> like, uh, no cash or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, he said a stall out pretty early, yeah, so. Yeah. He, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's not a big contract, but straight away, then I think he got uh, an image, he's got, getting sponsored by um, Red Bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said, I think he's, the max that he can pay him is 45 grand. So he's on a 45 grand contract. But then off the back of coming to New York, because it's going to be such a, to have such a, a global star like, like Bastro there, I think Red Bull are going to pay him a, a, a lucrative image rights deal then. <coughs> but it still sounds mental. When I went home that night, man, because he kept talking about Ben Foden. Yeah. And I was like, Ben Foden, yeah, I played against him. Yeah, he, was, he was a good player. Uh, I, I, I started, there was a, I watched like all the stuff about Ben Foden on TV uh, or on YouTube and stuff like that then. And uh, it's pretty, pretty <coughs> mental, man. I watched Ben Foden was talking about like getting up his grooming routine and all this. Yeah. And now he's over there and I don't know what the future is. Like, is he going to become a celebrity there? Or I think he's that. Yeah, that's his career. That's his career plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to start becoming a celebrity. <laughs> I don't know. That's yeah. The rugby's going to have to probably be on another level for him to get that kind of recognition. Yeah. But yeah, fair enough if that's his plan. Yeah. So um, anyway, we caught up uh, on Sunday night, and then on Monday I went to Boston to see um, to meet a couple of youth soccer teams, and we had our eyes opened. We're obviously working with that technology solution for scheduling and planning mm. with sports teams at the minute, and I had no idea how big that youth soccer uh, market is in the states. Some of the people you met, some of the influence, again, a lot of Irish guys. Irish guys helping out Irish guys seems yeah. to be the way it is. But yeah, we had our eyes opened. A few days over there, quick, um, quick couple of days, loads of meetings, met loads of good people, a lot of potential, and then straight back in Thursday morning. So I was knackered by the end of it. Potential Ooh. cash. Um, poten- well, we're gonna we're gonna trial it with um, a couple of teams out there. What clubs is it? Rugby or rugby? No, so- just soccer. soccer. Sorry. Yeah. Listen, man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, rugby United New York are gonna use it as well. Yeah. The rugby team. Yeah. So. Very cool. Yeah. Um, right on today's show. Very cool. We. Uh, yeah. War he matches. tried to derail the negotiations. <laughs> he was like. With your man. I was like, don't cock block me, flab. I'm trying to get. <laughs> I wasn't trying to derail. <laughs> yeah. You d- yeah. Because you were so. F- Fixated on oh, okay, this guy yeah, from yeah. school is now like yeah, um, yeah, leading yeah. this New York team. I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, flirt with him, and yeah, 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 yeah. It took about thirty seconds. He just said, "Yeah, I want to use your product. That's good. Yeah, great." Yeah, he done. only had eyes for you, I think. No, anyway. I think he only had eyes for himself, just telling his story. Yeah. Which anyway, is, he's getting sorry, enough. Right. He's gotten enough. Yeah. Uh, Warm up matches. A complete waste of time. Not. No. Unbelievable. No. Shadow boxing. No. Some, probably the games of the weekend are better than some of the Six Nations matches, I would think. Yeah, the Wales England game, I, I only saw bits of it, but it was very much like a Six Nations game, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, incredible intensity um, and physicality and skill level. Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. <laughs> 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 okay, we get to England Wales because that's Ireland are going to play them next, England next week and Wales following weeks. So we'll come back to that. Uh, we'll also talk with France <coughs> and Scotland, who, uh, in my opinion, France probably put in one of the best performances I've seen from an international team. It was the France of old, wasn't it? It was like everything, like order is being restored to the world of rugby <laughs> because the French are back. Or else Scotland are shit. <laughs> it's yeah, one or the other. Yeah. I can't tell which one, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the championship in the Southern Hemisphere, South Africa versus Argentina, and firstly, New Zealand versus Australia. The narrative over the last few weeks has been New Zealand are, are falling apart. They're not uh, half the team they used to be. They don't have the right combinations around the team. They're not settled into a proper team. No one knows what kind of way they're playing. They've been beaten by everyone. South Africa, on the other hand, are unstoppable. They are now the best team in the world. They're going to demolish everyone. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just like, after one weekend of rugby, it's kind of flipped again Yeah. Uh, for me. Exactly. So, what New Zealand needed was a test match at <clears> Eden <throat> Park. Exactly. Where they can get back to the way they were. Yeah. So um, what's, well, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on the last couple of weeks? Like, Do you pay much heed to that? Like that? I suppose with the World Cup, with the World Cup looming so close, 
everyone's got a heightened interest in the in these games and seeing how teams are going because the form the, it's it's going to roll straight into the World Cup. There'll be such a short uh, short short gap in between it, but it's uh, we were we were chatting about it before. How the fact that New Zealand were were not playing as as they as they normally were, that were not as dominant as they normally would, that meant everyone else was kind of like, ooh, I think I've got a bit of a chance here, mm -hmm. and the fact that the box were back as one of the one of the the strongest teams in, in the in the world, apparently anyway, from from their performances. The fact that Wales are the Six Nations champions, but everyone knows how strong England are. Ireland having been consistently one of the, one of the, the, the top team in the Northern Hemisphere, it's it's wide open. And then seeing how how France played there, off the back of the All Blacks not, not being so dominant, everyone else kind of feels like now this is the most open World Cup ever, and which it is. Uh, I thought I thought. New Zealand had been particularly poor in the last couple of games. I thought this weekend they weren't. It wasn't like just ripping, ripping New Zealand, or ripping Australia apart. But I thought they felt they played really pragmatic rugby. I thought Aaron Smith was excellent. I thought they, um, they just. I think they they ended up they had thirty one kicks to Australia's fifteen when Australia had beaten beaten them. Um, when Australia when Australia played well the previous week. Australia depended on like really strong set piece delivery to launch their running game using Karevi, using Kerbietti. But this weekend their 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 scrum was under the pump all the way through the game. Their line out delivery was poor and they were just trying to they were trying to run but they were getting knocked back whereas the the uh, the All Blacks I think Smith mixed it up really well. He played both sides of the ruck using the short side. Ardi Sarvia I had a massive game there, he had like 12 carries. And every time you come back down the short side, when teams can take line speed against the All Blacks, the only way to, teams are starting to cop now, if you're going to play against the All Blacks, you've got to put their skill set under pressure. You've got to have real hard line speed. So when the All Blacks are coming back down to the blind, they're using their forwards, they're using the likes of Ardi Savia to create one-on-ones because teams can't press them as hard. And then Savia's evasion, they're making easy meters there and then they're on the front foot and they can launch from there. When they didn't have momentum, the All Blacks just played a really smart kicking game uh, between Moanga, between Bowden Barrett and between Aaron Smith. Either just little dinks just in over the defensive line when teams are coming with, with the, that line speed or else putting the ball long in behind, finding touch and pressuring the, the Australian line out or else just, just cross field kicks as well. I thought it was I thought it was a really, really impressive display from that the All Blacks. Game, like, they were very switched on, they were very pragmatic but I thought the, the performance was encapsulated by their like how much hurt there's been, I think, or how much. Mm. Like it, it reminded me a little bit of whenever we brought them back to Dublin in 2016 mm -hmm. and having all the chat about how well Ireland played in Chicago. They were just reeling, I think, a couple of weeks later and you got that physicality and that nastiness. So there was a lot of smarts about what they were doing with the kicking game, with fine and shape, but they just, they just were so up for it, so physical. Like um, Dan Coles flinging Nick oh, White, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like out of the ring, mm. um, stuff like that, and a lot of a lot of stuff going on at breakdown as well. Really, really nasty. There was a nasty edge, there mm. a competitive edge. There was even in the hacker, they were like you could see they were pumped. And yeah, Kieran Reid, I think in particular was like <clears throat> hasn't been his best for the last few weeks. Yeah, he's probably he was, read a bit of that. Yeah, you know, and that's probably fired him yeah. up. Here's my to borrow a phrase by Blind Boy Bowl Club. My hot take on. On New Zealand, like they've often been, in, you know, they've it's been said that they don't show their hand coming into World Cups. They often like to hold back. I reckon the last few weeks they they've always had the ability to do what they did at the weekend. And the difference for me was the kicking game. They did, they kicked the ball and they kicked the ball like moonga has been kicking the ball for Crusaders all season. A huge variety of of kicking, little chips, little dinks, and as like he kicked again. I think in one of the one of the. The, it was either the semi-final or the or the, the last game of the or the second last game before that, in the champ in the sorry Super Fourteen, he kicked the ball forty two times in the game, but you wouldn't think they were kicking the ball a lot because it was all creative, mm. and it was just creating this chaos around the pitch, so they they did that. Whereas in the first three games of the championship, they've been keeping the ball alive and just passing the ball across the pitch. So it's almost like they're told to go out and just let's just play ball, just throw the ball around the place. Uh, Create, recreate the, the understanding between the players that like you know the relationships the, the offloading game let them play a little more freedom um, get that side of their game up to scratch because their skill level wasn't great for the first few games but it's just been getting better and better 
And then this weekend, it's like now, okay, we'll go out, we'll play a complete game. We'll start kicking the ball more, we'll run it, we'll start counter-attacking a little bit uh, more. And I don't know, that's my hot take in it, that I think they don't, they don't, they, New Zealand can always go out and play like they did at the weekend. So why would they, I suppose, choose not to, other than to just let a little bit more freedom seep in? Yeah, to learn a few things. like to pick Maybe, up a, yeah. Uh, make, make themselves I know it's, very, it's, it's a guessing game here, but yeah. like... Um, I don't know. It's just I, I I like to believe that, that there's a little bit more freedom in what they do. Yeah. I, th I, I mean, think that they they got the they got the focus better uh, between they got or they got the balance better between running and kicking the ball. Hmm. Like I think in the previous games, like you were saying, teams are hammering them with their line speed, particularly the box. And uh, and when you're trying to if if you don't have momentum, if you if you get initial momentum off your set piece, then it's very hard for the opposition to bring to bring that speed off the line in defence which then allows you a little bit more time on the ball to, when you're attacking. I felt the All Blacks were, they were probably not getting that initial momentum and then they were still trying to move the ball all the time and th it ended up with a lot of errors. Now, on transitions and on unstructured play, they're still going to be the most, the, the most dangerous team in the world, mm. but yeah, that's where I felt they were, they were slow uh, out of the blocks to start with. I felt like they managed it much better at the weekend when they didn't have momentum Kicking doesn't become <coughs> defensive then, or it's not conservative. Like you were saying, the, the kicks that they were using, they were exploiting the space that was there. So if teams are bringing all that line speed, when Smith or Bowden Barrett just drops a little dink in behind them, it, it actually it, it starts to, teams that are defending them start going, oh, we can't bring that kind of line speed out of the block. Mm. And to build on your hot take, I was looking at this because I've seen it in other sports, and I know, I know it's, it, it was something that Ireland used well at the weekend, or against, against Italy, is you know in the pressing game, if you, go, if you go to football, when they play the pressing game, it's all about leaving one attacker, the furthest attacker. You're pressing, 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 trying to get to the ball to leave the furthest guy because you know if they're trying to get the ball to that, to that furthest away attacker, you've got the recovery time to get to it. So teams are coming up in defence now in, in rugby and they're leaving the last man and they're trying to hammer with their line speed mm -hmm. because they know if they have to try and get the ball from one side of the pitch to the other, it takes maybe three to four passes. They think will cut out that last pass. They won't get that last pass. So you can start to see now that they're leaving that last defender, but teams are starting to utilise the kick pass a lot more and using the kick in an attacking way. And at the moment, it's probably a little bit dictated because you're only going to have a certain amount of players who've got that skill set. You're going to have your, if you went to the All Blacks, you'd have Aaron Smith, Moanga, Bowden Barra are going to be the, the guys who've got the, the strongest kicking game there. But I think that you watch it in the in the Wales and England game as well. The kicking game, the attacking kicking game, if it's done well, it's so creative and it's so dangerous and it's so hard to defend. Because you can press as hard as you want with your line speed, <coughs> but there's going to be space. And if someone's really accurate with their kick, hmm. like Joey Carberry's kicking for when we were talking about the exits yeah. for Andrew Conway, like the accuracy on his kick allowed Conway to get right into that and create hmm. one-on-ones. And you should win the ball then, you know. You've okay. got, so to play more on my hot take, so New Zealand go out and play against South Africa two weeks ago and uh, South Africa blitzed them off the line and New Zealand are just shoveling the ball across the pitch, mm. side to side, trying to offload and South Africa are like, yeah, this is playing into our hands. Come the first game of the World Cup, South Africa are going to bring the exact same line speed. They're going to leave LaRue and Colby or whoever it is mm. probably more exposed at the back. And they're just going to think, yeah, well, it, it worked for us before, it's going to work again. And New Zealand are going to do what they did at the weekend against Australia and just find grass, find space with the kicking game and still have the ability, because they still open <coughs> them up a lot mm. with the offload and with the passing game, so still being able to do both of those. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking, like, are they keeping their cards close to the chest? Is this the reason why? Because, like, and, and Ireland, for, for the same reason, if they end up playing South Africa um, in the quarter final. You know, there's a good chance they will. Uh, they're going to have to apply something different. They can't go out and do what they did against England and just run into these lads who are just milling up the field. They're going to have to bring a little bit more variety, which I was delighted to see them do against Italy when they didn't do one box kick. Like I think yeah. you, you spoke about it last week, those mm. open <coughs> open Gary Owens for, for Conway. Like, that's, that's a brilliant option to have. Now to have that, to have cross fields, also to have Murray's box kicks, to have little dinks. And I think what you're saying like about the who who can kick the ball is very important. In Ireland they have quite a lot of kickers involved. Like Henshaw can kick the ball. Farrell actually is a pretty decent uh, grubber and 
that kind of open spiral into the corner you can do. Ring mm. rows can kick. Kearney, I think we've got a lot of uh, ability, so we need to bring that variety. And the difference is going to be when you have when you have forwards who can kick the ball as well. We might be talking 10, 15 years down mm. the line, <laughs> yeah. but forwards kicking the ball. I think Mantera, uh, Matera, the back row for for um, for Argentina. Yeah, yeah. I saw him. They had a, I think they had a, they had a knock on advantage, and he he dinked the ball. I nearly regathered it, but. Mm. It's the same idea if you go back go back 20 years ago in rugby, there's only certain guys who could really pass the ball well. Mm. The rest of the guys just get the ball and truck it. And you've seen how the game's evolved now, that the more you can have 15 players on the field who, can all, who are all genuine attacking options, everyone can carry a ball, but everyone being able to pass the ball and link and play as well. And if defences, if it's going to go the way it seems to be at the moment where teams are pressing so hard with defence and putting, putting that, you know, the wide, wide game under pressure, well, then that's when the kicking game is going to come in. But if the kicking game is only limited to three or four players, it's going to cut down your options. Um, I think the likes of Justin Tipperick and players like that, you know, they're, they're guys who, who have that in their game. It's probably mm. just not being exploited enough because it's, it's, not an, it's not seen enough as an avenue that you, have to, that you have to use. But I think that that's something that's going to happen. And with that in mind, when, let's say, taking Ireland into consideration, when teams kick like that against Ireland or against you, how you... Uh, deal with that is, is going to be a huge part of the World Cup as well. So, mm. how, like Ireland didn't deal with it when it came to England doing it in, in the Six Nations. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I watched Ireland against Italy last week. It highlighted, even though Larmer is on the pitch, who's you know, you know one of the most exciting players, attacking players we have, his counter attacking was pretty poor, I thought, to be honest with you. And I started looking back at Ireland's counter attack for the last year or so, Six Nations, and, and like. That we don't. It's not a part of our game that we we. It's not a yeah, but major ar part of our, our armor or whatever. Yeah. What's your from you dealing with Joe? What's his uh, attitude towards counter attack? Um, well, the kid uh, Jordan Armour, I thought we're used to seeing him play for Leinster and playing at the league or playing um, European level. And there's there's so much more. It's just it's a different game altogether. I think once you get the Test match level, even if it's Italy and even if it's a preseason friendly. I still think there's just nowhere near the space that you expect. But what was his attitude towards it, Joe? Was it was it because he seems to be very happy with Rob Kearney uh, being solid, not not a threat. He's he's not a scoring fullback. Doesn't often make breaks. So it seems like he what he wants from his back three is solid, keep the ball. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and you're not, I yeah. think if you're going to get caught, either going sideways or caught, caught with most of your teammates in front of you, then he'd rather you put. Um, put the ball either contestable or, or send it long and find grass or send it long, long and don't find grass just up in the trams but I think Carney generally makes that decision correctly mm. but I mean if if guys get too ambitious or feel like they can can run something back or spot something that's not there if Larmer was to maybe listen I know a lot of a few people have said that when I've been chatting to them if Larmer was to listen to that and think you know I need, I need to start back myself more or he could make a couple of mistakes. He could start forcing it, mm. start to see a counter attack opportunity that's not there, get kind of chopped down behind the gate line or get chopped down behind his teammates, turn over ball, and then you're going, that is not that's not what you want from a test match level at all. And Joe would be Joe would be cracking up with that. Because his percentage is back there. Mm. Um for me. I do think though that like what separates the All Blacks from the rest of the teams in the world is their ability to score. I saw stats for... Bowden Barrett, I suppose, for, for yeah. in the Australia game. They have, from from turnover ball, uh, from scoring <clears throat> one to three phases on turnover ball, New Zealand have scored 22 tries. This is before Saturday. They've scored 22 tries in the last 18 months from in one to, two, three, one to three phases mm -hmm. from turnover ball. Second in place was... And now they scored three at the weekend, so that's up to 25. Second in place was Ireland with nine, which I was very surprised to see, but six of them were against Italy. So mm. I was like, nah, yeah. nah. when stats lie. <laughs> uh, and then all the other teams were like three, four. And I was like, this is why New Zealand, for me, are, are the, the best team in the world because they I can don't spot that. that. I don't, but, but that's it. They spot it. I think they're the best team in the world because they read it and they make the right decision. They only go whenever there's an opportunity to go. But I think making that right decision is crucial. And I think. But if you're not, if you're not given the freedom, maybe, to 
or encouraging I think, it. I, I definitely don't think Joe would say no counter attacking today. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I think he would say okay, but that's that's a question. Yeah, make the it. make the right decision or try and read what's in front of you and be sensible. Mm. And maybe maybe we are slightly more conservative. Mm. But I can can you imagine the amount of criticism would go um, to a Jordan Larmer or a, a Rob Carney if they try to counter attack from their own half? They get chopped down, give away a penalty, put it in the corner. You know, like, those are big. Those are big decisions for what a what a fullback has to do. Um, I suppose it's the culture that we that we've maybe that we're. I suppose it's it's how much support he's getting back as well. How much his wingers and centres are, yeah, are getting there, back to help him out. Is there an expectation to just letter the ball and to keep it safe? You know that we've that that that's what everyone expects from our back three now. Um, whereas like moving on to France and Scotland the weekend, where like genuinely one of the best performances I've seen from a team that were. France were unbelievable. I think Fly, you, you saw it as well. Mm. Like they to have a second hot take on French <laughs> rugby, they have like everyone's been like France will not conform to playing like everyone else. They're just playing uh, fucking Jouet rugby for the last few years. But are they going full circle where they're now they've created a culture that we just play what's in front of us and we just run the ball and like so it's finally come good well they haven't spent a lot of time together let's say over the last you know since the world cup the french national team would never spend probably spend less time than any of the other national teams together because the the demands that come with with the french league whereas now they're getting to spend a full pre-season together before the world cup will kick off they'll have played four games and then they'll just get stronger and stronger you'd imagine for every game that they're playing and that understanding and that skill level because like the quality of player that france has is unbelievable and to think that they haven't been performing for a few years it's like what why has that been when you watch them at the weekend man like yeah they, I, they looked they didn't look disorganized but they looked not as structured but it was the flatness that they were hitting the game line at their back rowers were coming around coming off Cam mm. Cam lopez and just finding space and hit 100 miles an hour coming from way really really deep and then hitting the line really flat and i don't know that's fine. I, I know, like, listen, the commentators at the time they're saying the pace that they're coming on at, but it's it's not just the pace because someone could come on at that pace and get it's milled <laughs> at yeah. the gain line. But it was they had enough shape yeah. to get enough soft shoulders to maybe get through, get their hands hands free. Again, Scotland. I, I don't know if Scotland look a little bit tired, <clears throat> or if France have actually had an unbelievable preseason. Yeah. But there was some. It'll be interesting to see. Is next week um, France Scotland again, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Isn't it? Weekend, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens well, if there's actually. any changes for Scotland as well. I'm mm. the same as you in that I think I, I'd like to see France back that up again. I, 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 it's going to be great for Ireland if Scotland are as bad as, as they showed there. They were really, really poor. I thought McNally, the hooker, stood out. Apart from that, I thought they were. They, it was just a really poor performance from them. It's funny when you said Baz about like, like, it's just play as you see. And, and run the ball because sometimes play, play as you see is actually like like, like I actually thought Jordan Lamore was, was decent against Italy He I know we didn't see him rip anyone apart mm. but if you think if you're Jordan his natural inclination is going to be to run because that's his strongest skill set so when he goes out there he's there okay well I want to prove to the coach that I, I can be a running fullback but I'm also I can be pragmatic and when, when the run isn't on, I'll, I'll either carry it up. Manage a game. Yeah, or yeah. else I can put it back into the corner and be safe on a high ball. He, he wasn't massively tested, but I thought he did well. And, and, and Rob Kearney is a really good example of a guy who makes really good decisions all the time, albeit he's not carving the line all the time. But that's because that's it's international rugby and there isn't always space like that. I thought, I, I did think France were, were phenomenal. I thought Penault was phenomenal, Dupont was phenomenal. And I don't know, I, I, I kind of feel, I don't want to get lulled into a wow, France are going to be amazing at the World Cup because it's so easy to do that now because the World Cup's so close and, and they were so dominant in the game. But I think if you watch if you watch the top 14 in France, like it's slow. You know what I mean? It's slow and there's players there who are super unfit. Mm. So there's a lot of logic to what you're saying. <coughs> when they can, and the players, are, there's a generally a pretty good spread across the league. Mm. Whereas when you can pull those players together, get them fit, get them aligned, get them to one purpose. And it's a, I, I thought it was a, a pretty, you know, there's, there's a good amount of young players coming through and French rugby, French underage is very strong at the moment. Mm. So there's good momentum coming from that. Hopefully, hopefully that they, it's, it's not a flash in the pan that they are building on it. I thought Vahamina was a massive, uh, in terms of like, everyone talks about like, 
you know, the French back tree and, and, and their flair and stuff like that. But Vahamina as a lock, I think he had, I just checked my stats. <laughs> Vahamina had 15 carries, 17 tackles. And they were all, like, they, they, were, they were big, big moments. And then with, with the likes of Raka on the wing, the Fijian, they, they do look in a really good place. It's, um, it's getting them fit, getting them aligned, because they were a disgrace during the Six Nations yeah. for the quality that they all <coughs> We're all kind of closet French fans, though. We yeah, all are I think so, I fans yeah. of the, like, the French team of the past. And because we haven't seen that in so long, then we're all getting si excited. We're all thinking, happy days, France are back. Mm. They're not... They're not back yet. Yeah. One game doesn't. I know. Will we just get kind of? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> hopeless romantic. Yeah. Um, if they back it up, I think then we just start having that like conversation. We saw stuff at the weekend that we hadn't seen in a long time. Like those lines you're talking about that the that the like cross and uh, Aldrich the the number eight and then Libyan, Yeah. Yeah. Were, the they lines were. they were hitting at pace. They were neither deep nor flat. They were just. Perfect and just here in yeah, his face. Yeah. So French, isn't it? Yeah. It's not deep. It's not flat. <laughs> yes. What is it? It's French. <laughs> but from an Irish point of view, oh, yeah, Scotland, so. Scotland were were so poor. Yeah. You know that it, like that that bodes well for us. You know. Did France look good because Scotland's set piece struggled a little bit? Like France just got their first phase was so dynamic and they mm. got so much joy out of that first phase. Then they looked. It's easy to play, and it's e especially easy for France to play because that's the way <coughs> they want to play. Yeah, the if, Scottish, if Scottish set piece had been better, or maybe their defence starters had been better, could it be more difficult for France? Yeah, well, look, I think I think um, I think Slimani was doing a, was doing a pretty good job on uh, on Jamie Baddy. He's slow sometimes when you're not actually able to watch the game live because you're only getting one angle when you're watching on TV. But I thought that the French scrum had had Scotland under pressure all the way through and. They brought on Xander Fagerson to replace Batty and they moved uh, Simon Bergen across to Lucid. You can see teams are trying to trial <coughs> that now. Prop who can play both sides to test rugby, which is difficult. There's a new law fly with the scrums as well. Yeah. The, the hooker's not allowed to rest his forehead on, is that it? Is something like mm. that? Well, not well, every back in world rugby just went. Who gives a crap? But <laughs> if you think of it, this, the, addressing the scrum, what, when, what we would have trained last year with Munster is that on the bind call, you're trying to deload as much of your weight onto the opposition to try and narrow up their hip angle and get them onto their onto their heels rather than on their front foot. Yeah, yeah. So that that deload there, you're you're trying to get when the referee calls bind, the props take their deload and they're trying to transfer weight. And for the hooker, because the hooker is binding there, the hooker is generally trying to get his head onto the opposition uh, hooker's right shoulder and try and deload the weight through there. So they're getting axially loaded here. And I speak to the physios inside Munster, and they'd say, "Listen, this is really, really bad for players. It's yeah. really, really bad. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't train it much. Do you know what I mean? Because you try and keep them out of that position. Yeah. But they, we do an awful lot of neck strengthening stuff so that they're able to, you're able to mitigate the the the, the pressures that are going through their neck. But yeah. it's, it's obviously that's why, like I saw that one of the reasons that they're bringing it in is to is to try and deload that deload that pressure on the but players' then necks. It's gonna um, there'll be more of a like a slight collision. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Which means it'll be less stable and there'll be more resets, probably. Yeah, well, when I when I went through the games from the weekend, the New Zealand had Australia massively under pump under the pump at the scrum. Um, I thought I thought uh, in the Wales England game, I thought England were dominant at the scrum and Wales just did a good job of managing the scrum to get out of there. And then in the the the, Fre the French were killing the Scottish and. South Africa, Argentina was a little bit, to me it looked like from the previous week, uh, South Africa d demolished Argentina. They made changes in the front row, bringing in, uh, they brought in Thomas Dutoy, um, Shark Bridge, they changed up their front row. Yeah. But they, uh, I think the referee, it, his interpretation was probably giving a, a, little bit, a little bit to the Argies as well. But, but the scrum, yeah, you're right, there was an awful lot more collapse scrums. The Scottish, um, uh, um, JP Nell, is it? Or uh, is he the first choice tight head? He, or he's in the mix, yeah. I think uh, they, went, they went Fagerson and Bergen at the weekend yeah. and put Bergen across and then brought Fagerson on. But the, the scrum, the you scrum is... Scrum? Uh, I, I used to go in the odd time way forward, like when For I... For the crack. So, if <laughs> someone was in then, <laughs> yeah. I remember sticking my head up Marcus Horn's arse because uh -huh. uh, I didn't know how to... To bind, he was just like, Did you like it? Did you like it? Black, get your head out of my no, leave, leave it be. Give it <laughs> more, 
<laughs> Morehead, Morehead, Morehead. <laughs> Could you head out? Put it back in again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the freedom. Yeah. Ben Six, just kind of <clears throat> le- legging around the place. Um, okay, quickly on Wales and England, because Ireland are playing the England at the weekend. Um, fairly, fairly bruising encounter. Um, I'd be afraid now we'll get another few feckin' injuries the weekend. Cloudy against playing against an English team. Yeah. Um, although I felt Wales were probably Wales probably have more to play for. England have their team are already they're already picked, um, already on the plane. Wales, you know, st- ranked number one in the world. Opportunity to stay there, yeah. um, home in the front in front of their home crowd and haven't been beaten last week. Thought they were massively up for it, whereas England probably a little bit less. I think that's pretty accurate. I thought I thought that it was a fin- it was an incredible game of rugby. Yeah, I thought the Welsh handling was so crisp, and they they mixed it up, moving the ball <coughs> from one side of the field to the other. Bigger was taking nothing out of it, getting the ball real crisp, moving the ball, and they were. It was like when you can see the you can see the the white line moving forward, the English defensive line. You're like, oh, is this pass going to get there? Is he going to get it? And it just they just get it away on the edge. I thought the the Welsh handling was excellent when they were going with the run, but then I think. When they started to mix it up, they just varied it really, really well. When they felt that line speed was coming, that's when they started using a lot of the contestable box kicks off Davies, bigger, oh, bigger, bigger in the air. When you talked about yeah. it last week, and you were saying what Felix was saying about just get in the air, sort of what and about Conway being able to add another fifty mm. grand to his contract or whatever, like what? 100, 100, 100 grand. grand. Don't shortchange him. <laughs> yeah, no. Don't shortchange him. He's worked hard for that. <laughs> but like. How, it's not rocket science with bigger does like, but it is so impressive, man. Mm. It's so impressive for a ten. Yeah. Because he's got so much more to worry about. Yeah. If he's gonna stay after training and do extras, he's gonna do a bit of passing, a bit of kicking, one or two other things, and then high ball reception. Yeah. I suppose maybe wheels is that the way they put bigger in the backfield much? Pardon? Do, do wheels put bigger in the backfield? Like purposely. Obviously, obviously he's not good. when he's when he's feeling yeah, those when he's yeah. when he's kicking and chasing them. He's a... Uh, he, you, you'd have a better appreciation for this because I just see it from Felix training at Munster and he says like to actually just get into the contest is thing, and he said it's actually you have to be brave to do it mm. because you're launching yourself up and at the ball you're trying to get up there you don't know what's, what, who's coming at you or, or what way you're going to land so to actually get fellas getting into the contest and you see bigger and the you know the commitment that he 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 puts into when he's getting up into the contest for the ball. But the thing about him is that he meets the ball on the way up, yeah. and the ball's come down, as opposed to floating there and waiting for the ball. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, you know, his timing is so perfect. Yeah, it's that he's almost less like a hummingbird, like just getting up and just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, it's because he, if he meets the opposition player and they both like the ball right between them, if it's fifty fifty. He's so dynamic yeah. that he always wins the battle. Okay. So he always kind of just, it just makes a slight difference. Even if the other guy's technically perfect, if Bigger wasn't there, he would take it. But it's just that collision in the air and then Bigger just wins it. Yeah. Carney again, he's another one. You would have had, yeah, yourself and Rob would have had a very, if you look at you like from a anthropometric point of view, like oh. you're tall, you know, you're explosive to get off the ground. <laughs> yeah. You've got long- Mary Poppins. <laughs> you've, got, you've got long arms. So. So like, what, did you have a process around how you trained your high ball? I I had to get. I wasn't very good naturally at all. So I got no GA background either. So I, I had to kind of start from scratch. It took me, and because I'm a position, so I was in the centre for my first year or two, mm. and then moved out. And obviously, then a couple of years later, that coincided with all of a sudden, if you can't compete in the air for a high ball, that's massive. That's probably biggest contribution for a winger nowadays. Mm whenever Joe arrived, but um, I couldn't even uh, get into the air to catch. I just, I, it just it freaked me out, especially if the ball isn't flying perfectly. You know, if a ball's perfectly end over end, mm. you can judge where it's going to land. If there's, if it's misstruck at all, then if you try and get in the air for those, then it's carnage. So I used to just, just stand. And if someone, no one did it back in those days though. No one ever got in the air to compete. So I just stood and then tried to use my footwork and just hoped that it wasn't that accurate. I hoped that there wasn't a damn bigger to pluck it. Mm. above my head but I just did it over and over like <clears throat> I, so I, I did it it was my main thing after sessions I always did it and then got got like got to the point where it was a strength um I wouldn't have been I don't know if I would have been known for it but certainly in my head I would have been a lot more confident what's uh 
What's so funny about that? No, nothing. I, <laughs> I, I'm at, like I'm asking. You said initially you're uh -huh. saying you used to stay on the ground and yeah. try and put footwork, and hopefully the kick was a little bit yeah. long that you got time to do that. Yeah. But after, when when obviously the contestables became more accurate and yeah. you're playing international <clears throat> rugby, did you did Joe put a focus on it with you and saying, listen, this is something we need you to develop here? Uh, I'm not sure if he took me aside and said to me personally, but there was a, it was becoming more and more common, and it was becoming more and more common that that someone chasing their own kick was actually getting up in the air and making it. I mean, it sounds obvious now that a contestable, you'd be able to contest for it, but mm. it wasn't for long periods. Mm. When, uh, when I know, whenever I first came through, for my first three, three or four years, I'd say that just didn't really happen. Mm. If I was chasing a kick, I'd wait for him to catch it and then try and nail him into touch. You know, it's strange that that's, that was what the tactics were, but Joe arrived and then everything changed and then I just picked that up and got rehearsed it over and over and got quite good at it. Mm. Quite good. Yeah. Another hundred grand in your contract. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, with that in mind, combinations for the weekend going into the, I know we're just guessing here, like, but he'll obviously bring a lot of the players that weren't playing last week into the fold. Sex will start, I'd imagine. Um, I thought Conway was brilliant last week. I'd love to see him getting a go. I think he's a very uh, capable 15 as well. Um, I'd love to see him get a, get a, a, sh a shot there. Uh, anything else you're expecting? You think Will Addison might get, get a run? Yeah, it'd be nice to see, yeah, because he's not being talked about at all. Yeah. Uh, if he what? gets a, if he gets a go, he can completely yeah. change the whole conversation. It's just centre combinations or the centre. Someone's going to lose. The options out, uh, we have are just so yeah. good. Like potentially even one of the the four could lose. You reckon? Yeah. Well, well, anyway, that's the, that's the chat. But mm. um, like Carberry just it's had, open book there. Like didn't Carberry just get um, something done to his ankle? Yeah. <coughs> Procedure, yeah. So, I mean, they haven't come out and said anything, I don't think, have they? I don't know, but no. Pat's away on, so we can't check. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're, they're going to, I think w with Joey's injury history and the fact that he, he played so well against Italy, I think that they're going to have to, they're going to want to get Rob Carney on the field and make sure he's up to speed as their number one. They probably want to make sure that, that, you that they start to, Confirm what that what that right Jordan is going to be our, our second choice number two number two at our, our second choice fifteen, or else get some game time into someone like like Conway or Addison, because uh, they're probably going to have to bring an extra probably Jack Hardy I imagine is going to go now mm. because of because of Joey's uh, Joey's injury and Jack Hardy is a very good player as well, mm. but they have, they'll have to have, go out there with three specialist tens, so I think trying to figure out who's going to play fifteen get I think the. the it should be a case of listen. They're playing against a, It'll be a, it'll be a very strong English side again. I think they should go with with as much first choice as they can and just get them on the field and get them because they're the guys that are going to win us the World Cup really mm. if it's going to go well for us. So get game time into them now. Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be a brilliant game again. They've been unbelievable games so far. So how to handle Billy Vanapola because he has been how they did how they will, will yeah. how will they handle Billy Vanapola because he's yeah. on a different level now mm. well it'd be interesting to see just in, in general how they play against England having play, you know, gotten taken apart in the first game of the Six Nations like how they manage their their you know their their game plan I suppose the um, yeah the English the, the English attacking kicks the last day mm. against Ireland we, we didn't deal with them well but it's interesting, when I was over in England doing the House of Rugby last week, the big point Rob Vickerman, who's a real rugby head, he was saying like um, the fact that they're fit, that the English team are fit. And I think it's something that we almost take for granted here in Ireland because you've got, f you've got the four provinces and it's very easy to affect change within those because you just Joe just speaks to the coach and that's it. They just do extra training. And there's good access for the, for the national coach with the players all the way through. Whereas I'm not sure it's the same, the, the same level of alignment through the English league, hmm. even though you think like, oh, the, the players should all be fit. But when they, they kept making the, the fact, like saying, listen, doing a pre-season with Eddie Jones coming into work up, they're going to be super fit. Billy Van Opola looks incredible. Like I, I was just hmm. watching him play. People just can't stop him. And it's not just that he's like a, a one-off ball carrier that is a wrecking ball. He is a wrecking ball, but he can pass, he can offload. He's... He's got a great work rate. He's just explosive. He's quick yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think that like when you start I think I think that the, the premiership is actually a pretty slow league, you know. The players are massive, it's quite slow. You're obviously gonna have the Saris and the Exeters that are that, that have got a real good level of fitness and they've got collision winners through their team. But after that, I think there's a there's a significant drop off as you go down the league. 
And uh, I think to get all of those players that are outside of Saris and Exeter and getting them, there's, there's probably an extra 10, 15% in them that you probably don't see through the year when they're playing, when they're just playing solely Premiership. Yeah. Okay, I think Mary Poppins is going to explode here, so move on. In part three, we've got Black or White. This is my first go off it. Um, will you sing us in? What? <laughs> we'll be back in a second. <laughs> All right, Flat, it's time to play black and white. Show <laughs> on. That's what I was asking for. As you know, a pint of Guinness is the perfect excuse to bring friends together, but on this black and white, it could split the house of rugby down the middle. Okay, I haven't played this before, but I have what, here what's going in on. my hands mm -hmm. two contentious statements, one pro, one against. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to give you this one, Barry. Okay. I'm going to give you this, and we're going to give you 60 seconds each. And you've got to argue the case for your statement. Okay. So Barry, your statement is? Ireland winning the World Cup would be the country's best sporting achievement. You're pro that. Andrew, you're against it. You have 60 seconds. Go first. Okay. The island of Ireland? Because Dean Mary Peters won a gold medal. Who's uh, that? Do you know, exactly. Do you not know Dean Mary Peters? <laughs> Sorry. She loves the show. And she's a big fan of yours. Yeah, she fancies you. Um, and Mary Peters won the heptathlon in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> and now there is a Mary Peters lounge named after her in New Forge, where we used to gym as Ulster. So that, to me, has left a legacy. And that, to me, is Ireland's greatest sporting achievement. Really strong. Uh, do I have to argue against that? Because that's too You're easy. You're arguing like. just why, why, why is winning the World Cup. Okay, well, first of all, I'm sorry, Dan. Dame. Dame. <laughs> Dame. <laughs> Dame. I haven't heard of you, but I'm sure I, I fancy you as well. Uh, Ireland winning the World Cup. Um, like, we've never won a World Cup for national... Have we not? No, we haven't. Um, it's like I went to see The Lion King a few weeks ago, and uh, it was uh, the shittest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Right, so did you? Did you like it? No, but I often disagree with you stuff like that. Okay, I thought it was the shittest thing I've ever seen. Worse than the Greatest Showman. It was te yeah, but that's that's the only thing we started on that. But my point being that like I'm trying to draw some sort of narrative between that and this, and I can't. Yeah, <laughs> I went to see um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood last week. And Just buy a new time here, yeah. the Tarantino movie, the new yeah. Tarantino. Unbelievable. Was it? Stick to the rules, right? 60 seconds. I'm, sorry, buying sorry. Them I'm buying them time. So I got your back on. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. So, like, um, we've never won a World Cup, so if we win a World Cup in any sport, this would be, we'd be the best team in the world. <laughs> that's not good enough. <laughs> that's not good enough. We won the World Cup in the 19s. <laughs> that's, that's junior. Let's be senior. Oh. Adults. Right, this is the Adults Rugby World Cup, isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay, I think I'm gonna have to give that one to. That's, that's to, to, to Dan. My argument was lame. It was yeah. still better than that. <laughs> that was an open goal, Dane. and you missed Dane. it. <laughs> She's a great team. Okay, so Barry, uh, Andrew takes this one. There's a little bit of armpit for you as well. Mm. Okay, congratulations, Andrew. That was absolute bullshit. You've obviously gotten some sort of a little clique going on here while I was gone. But look, uh, the, the No Barry team. The No Barry Club. Club. Right, thanks everybody for listening uh, on all your favorite apps and for those of you watching us on YouTube uh, and for all your great feedback about the show. It's been so good to be back. I feel yeah. like I'm home. Thank you, lads. Uh, cheers to everyone that was involved in making the show today for, uh, for putting this all together. Paul, Fiona, Pat, Anthony and Philip. This has been Baz and Andrews, House of Rugby, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Party on. Party on. Party on. <laughs> <laughs>